Welcome to the R and J Yarn, a podcast where we chat to people doing innovative things in the community whose stories sometimes go untold. We'd like to chat to people about their careers and what made them become the person they are today. So this is our first video interview, Ron. And so perhaps we should kick off by telling our listeners a bit about ourselves. Yeah, sure. So I'm studying nutrition at uni at the moment and I have a real passion for food, coffee and investing in those passions. And I also love heading down to the beach and um, collecting you know, vinyl records and huge passion for music. Um, so what about you, Q? What, tell us a bit about yourself. Okay, Rob. Well, I came over from New Zealand about two and a half years ago. And I suppose the first thing is I joined a tennis club down here in Hawthorne. And that's where I met yourself, Rob, uh, which was great. And as you know, I love all my sports, love my cricket, love my tennis. Uh, running, racing, anything really, so Melbourne's been a really great fit for me. But outside of all that, I'm passionate about renewable energy, and so I've got a great job working for a company called Octopus Investments, uh, where we focus on new wind farms, solar farms, batteries, and all sorts of things in that field. And I guess, Ron, that's a bit about, it's kind of why we started the podcast, wasn't it? so that we could talk about, talk to people in these areas that we're passionate about. Yeah, totally, Jimmy. We started the podcast about three months ago, and it's been a really inspiring journey for us. Plus, you know, I'm super excited um, with today's episode being our first video format for, you know, all of our listeners, like, I guess, viewers today. Um, and we plan to, you know, be releasing a few more down the track, so you have to stay tuned. And today's guest, is Sydney fund manager Michael Frazes, and he has his um, his own hedge fund over in Sydney. And the thing that we like about him is he shares the same passion as us. Um, he likes investing in you know identifying companies that have that same high growth potential. And um, yeah, he started the fund at just the age of 29. Mm. Yeah, he's a very impressive guy. He's uh, he's quite charismatic. And definitely his story of starting that fund uh, is a very is a very inspiring one, as you said. So I think today's episode will be such a valuable listen for anybody who's contemplating a career in finance or who's passionate about investing. So Ron, let's listen to the show and we can have a chat at the end about what we learned. Sounds good, mate. Today's guest is Michael Frazes. We're having this chat at Michael's beautiful offices here in Sydney CBD at Governor Phillip Tower. Michael's story is unique to say the least. Born and raised in Sydney, Michael excelled through his schooling and studies, finding himself attending Oxford University. At Oxford, he attended, attained a master's in chemistry along with a bachelor of arts. Surprisingly, perhaps obvious for Michael, his first job out of uni was as an intern in an investment bank. He then spent the next few years in a private equity firm on the side, Um, started at the age of 29, what is now known as Fraser's Capital Partners. His investing philosophy is to invest in companies that people love and that have explosive growth. He also runs a podcast called Fraser's Capital Podcast, and just recently he launched a new venture fund. Michael, it's an absolute honour to have you here today. How has your weekend been? Uh, It's been good. Thanks for having me on. Great. Okay, Michael, so we'd like to kick off with some quick-fire questions. Uh, so first one, nice and easy, favourite beach in Sydney? Uh, that's easy for me, it's Tamarama. It's a beach I grew up in and Be- currently live by as well. Beautiful spot. Okay, best thing about living in Oxford? Uh, to be honest, probably the architecture. <laughs> it's a really beautiful place. Yeah. Um, lots of parks, lots of beautiful buildings. Um, obviously, I was a student when I was living there, but you're working quite hard as a student. Yeah. So I'd say the buildings are the, and the best and most obvious part of Oxford. Okay, so you're there for about eight years. Best thing about returning to Sydney? Oh, they're, they're just such different places. I mean, I, I find uh, England's much more social. Everyone goes out a lot more and you, you're not really, you don't really spend much time at home. Sydney, everyone's a lot more alone. Like, you run, you exercise, you kind of surf. That's just been my experience. Um, so the good parts of both of those places are why they're so different. Okay, next one, bit of a random one. Second airport in Sydney, yes or no? Uh, I just hope I don't get confused and go to the wrong one. (laughs) (laughs) 
Okay, next one. Uh, we're obviously from Melbourne, so if we were going to have a quick drink after this, what would be favourite bar in the CBD for a quiet mid-afternoon drink? Um, I'd probably go to District under Chifley. I'm not sure it's quiet, but there's lots of people about, so it's usually quite a bit of fun. Okay, just take note for afterwards, Ronnie. And <laughs> what about Saturday night, 8 o'clock, where would you want to be? Uh, tough one. It's pretty hard to go past anything that's, you know, a Maryvale venue, I'd say. Mm, sounds good. Okay, last question, last quick fire question. Um, what's your favourite company on the ASX that you've sort of got a bit of a soft spot for? Soft spot for? Um, quite like Camplify, it's like an Airbnb for RVs. Mm. Uh, and Setai is like a kind of online luxury fashion brand. Yeah. They're kind of our two number one picks. Mm. Our two favourite picks, I should say. They both can't be number one. Mm-hmm. So, Michael, we just want to start with you telling us a bit about growing up in Sydney. Um, what was it like for you as a kid, you know, being... I don't know, I guess I had a pretty typical yeah. childhood in Sydney. I don't think it was particularly, like, notable. Um, I was pretty kind of, I was a bit of a bookworm, pretty quiet, kept to myself. Um, mm. Went to school. Not many people lived around where I did. Um, mm. Yeah, I'm not sure what to say. <laughs> I don't think it's distinct enough or interesting enough. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> Um, so your father's held high-level executive roles in banking. Do you think you were destined for a financial services career because of that? Uh, I think it's always in your back of your mind what your father does. It kind of helps because mm. you're just exposed to whatever industry. You know, people, kids of mm. doctors often become doctors, mm. as another example. Um, he also took a much more kind of corporate route. So, mm. um, yeah, definitely kind of helped in the sense you're exposed to the industry and people in it. Mm. And it's running through your mind from when you're very young. Um, that's about the extent of it. And so you've said you were one of the lucky kids who always knew what he wanted to do when he grew up. Um, where did that sort of come from? Uh, but that kind of mean like after I was 18, I kind of knew I wanted to do what I'm doing now. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, I think when I was a little kid, I wanted to be an inventor, which is completely different. Um, but when I was 18, I knew I wanted to do what I did, wanted to do now, which meant that throughout university, you can kind of chart a course to get there. Whereas obviously some people graduate and then start looking for jobs and careers. And it, it's, it's just a little bit harder in those ultra-competitive um, yeah. professions. But of course, a lot of people just find their own way and, and do extremely well and often much better anyway. So. Mm-hmm. And so you were at Sydney Grammar and uh, so you must have been, what, 17, 18 and you made the decision to go over the other side of the world to Oxford like... Well, um, I guess why did you do that and what was, the, what was, your, what was your motivation for him overseas then? Um, I kind of did a gap year and travelled around and then applied for Oxford in a gap year and just got in and then the decision was kind of made. Yeah. Um, I, at the time I really wanted to live overseas. I just wanted to do something mm-hmm. adventurous and something slightly different. And I was pretty excited to study science as well. So that were kind of two things. I think if I was in Sydney I would have ended up doing commerce or something. Yeah. It's like mm-hmm. a similar degree to many, many other people. Yeah. And so... You, I think, uh, so you studied uh, chemistry, was it? Correct. And uh, so you, but you always knew you were, did you always know you were going to get into financial services and you sort of thought that chemistry might give you an edge if you did that? Uh, it's probably the opposite. I wanted, kind of knew I wanted to get into financial services and wanted to do something different for a degree. I didn't want to study what I ended up doing. You know, mm-hmm. do something different, learn about something different. Yeah. I was kind of thinking. Mm-hmm. And so that give you like an advantage, would you say, to then now being in investing and not having that same background to other people that, you know, have done what you've done as well? Um, I think it definitely helps having a different background. I think mm. doing commerce is a really bad way to get into something mm. like finance. Mm. That's the obvious one. Mm. Um, yeah. It's what everybody does. Yeah. I think it just, it's, it's, firstly, it's very hard to get roles because there's so many people graduating in the same degree. Mm, totally. Secondly, you just it, you kind of think the same way mm. and speak the same way. It's very hard mm. to stand out. Um, and especially in this game where you're kind of in the markets, you've really got to be different to kind of do well, I think. Um, and generally, the more you are different, generally, the better you can go. Mm. Um, whereas all the conventional stuff, like that stuff's been done to death. There's too many people doing it. Um, generally, you make money when you're thinking differently and doing something differently. Mm-hmm. That's been my experience anyway. Yeah, I totally agree with that. Like, it's one of the things with Ron and I, we do a bit of investing on the side. And Ron studies um, health sciences and nutrition and that. And I think that's really good because I did what you said. I did like a pure play, finance and accounting, and then um, did honours and that, and then did the CFA and stuff like that. Yeah. So exactly like you say, there's th- you know hundreds of thousands of people in Australia who have done that. You know. Yeah, and, definitely. And so if I'm looking at like a say Inconex, like the um, medical marijuana stock, you know you'd know way more about that than I would. Mm. In terms of like you'd you'd be better off talking to him differently mm. than me. 
Yeah, yeah well, it definitely helps um, if you look at anything biotech or health related. We've got some science degree. Yeah. Even then, I wouldn't consider myself an expert in any of those stocks. So we'll use experts and bring people in house and do expert networks and find key opinion leaders as well. Yeah. And so you then like came back from Oxford, and you obviously um, then worked a few jobs here, and then decided to sort of start the fund. Who were the first sort of people that you got in contact with? To you know, start oh, doing that. I was pretty heavy going. Yeah. So like, who were, like the three talk. core people? that you maybe call first and say, hey, this is what I'm doing, what can you bring to the table? Uh, I'd say pretty much everybody, I thought it would be family, friends, and that was generally not a route that mm. was, I, there's definitely family, friends, and mm. people mm. I've known in my life kind of in the fund now, but yeah. at the start it was pretty tough going in that. Mm. You almost need to find people that are interested in what you're doing. Mm. I'd say the thing that worked best was probably setting up a mailing list, writing, putting thoughts out there, finding people that were interested in that. And then mm. some of those were people that I already knew, mm. but the vast majority of investors came through that channel um, and are not people that I knew before. So it's sort of just like messaging people on LinkedIn and saying, I'm thinking of doing this. Um, you know, not maybe, really. I think um, mm. it's more, it more a case of just setting up a blog, you know, old school. Oh, yeah, okay. yeah. yeah. And I'd say that's probably the best way to get. And so did you kind of create like your own portfolio that you kind of then would blog about? And... And then kind of, I'm trying to remember. Like what was sort of on the blog we, in those early um, days? It's also there. I mean, I set, I set the first one up in 2016. Yeah. Um, so it was all generally writing about portfolio, what was in it, mm. what we were looking at. Um, people are always interested in people who have like opinions and who mm. are writing, seem to have interesting ideas and are thinking a bit differently. There's always mm. like a market for that. So in finance, there's so much stuff is written um, and very little of it is read. Um, but there's still a need for that. There's people still want to find something interesting on, on a mm. stock. There's a lot of people that have like a passion for it. Mm. And so it's a good way for people to break through and get a name for themselves without anything is just start writing or mm. podcasting or something. Yeah. And um, so me and Jimmy are thinking of potentially going down a similar path, maybe not for 10 years or so. Oh, but if someone... Have met, hopefully. Yeah, hopefully it's <laughs> maybe in five years. If we were looking to start um, our own sort of fund, what would be like your words of advice to someone who wanted to do that? Uh, that would be it. I'd say build an audience and mm. get a group of following and write and mm. people that like what you're doing will be interested. Mm -hmm. So I guess um, that's you what, be what we're doing here with our, our podcast, getting that, <laughs> that yeah. following. I don't think you, one thing I learned is you, you can't convince somebody. There's yeah. no point pitching some random person you know to see if they're interested in the fund. Yeah. Like mm. just people have so many things they can do with their money. They might want to buy a house or... Yeah. They buy a new car or invest in any of a million different things. Um, mm. You're better finding people that are interested in exactly what you're doing. Yeah. Mm. And the best way to find those people is just put yourself out there. Yeah. Mm. And so when you set up, and obviously you've got a beautiful office here, um, so tell us about those early days. Like obviously you just decided to set up your own business. Did you did you go into it with a business partner, and and how did you go about hiring your first couple of staff, and and who were the first couple of staff you hired? Not like the people necessarily, yeah. but the sort of roles. Uh, I had an intern who was, I think, first at uni at the time. He was super energetic and it was basically yeah. just us for a while. Yeah. Um, then there was Anna, who I'm actually related to, who then joined um, shortly after. And then a year and a half ago, we kind of went through a period of growth. And that's when he basically expanded the team and built. Mm. It was pretty long going. It took four years to yeah. get any kind of traction at all. Mm. And what do you look for in the staff? Like, so do you, what, what sort of characteristics do you, do you look for people who are coming into the business? Um, depends on the role, but... People who think differently and are interesting and mm -hmm. independent thinkers, I think, mm -hmm. I find the most compelling. Mm -hmm. I think my, I think a lot of other people in the industry would say the same. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Okay. And so, and so you set up the fund and you came up with this philosophy. I, I presume I don't know if this has changed. Maybe it's changed, but certainly, um, the philosophy is about investing in companies that have that durable customer love and they're exposed to explosive growth and mm. you've talked about that quite a lot. Um, how did you, you know, how did you sort of come up with that and how did you firm in your mind that that was the best kind of river? I always say to Ron, you know, like, you want to be in the fastest flowing river and mm. how did you kind of come up with that being the criteria you're looking for? I think it was a case of just um, thinking about what had worked in the last few decades and what, what were those common themes. So mm. I came from a conventional finance background, so I did, actually I went to, did a Master of Finance at LSE. So you know, all the conventional valuation stuff, obsessed with value investing. Um, there's like a route that I think everybody of a certain 
like this huge age group where we all kind of read the same books, did the same things. Mm. Now it's starting to slightly change. Um, but really it was like a kind of that Buffett hagiography, Graham and Dodd, you know, all that intelligent investor, um, looking at things the same way, but it just didn't, um, just didn't fit with the things that were working, and they were working for very good reason. You know, your Tesla's afterpays, um, software businesses often losing money, no free cash flow. They're not fifty. They're not a dollar trading for fifty cents at all. It's like anything the opposite. Mm -hmm. It's like pay three or four dollars for you know fifty cents of value now, growing at one hundred percent a year. You know, it's that kind of mm -hmm. completely different way of looking at things. And now the most successful investments. Um, you know, I was working in private equity and we're doing a ton of work. It was really complicated, difficult stuff. Um, grinding out returns over a number of years um, in these businesses and then the whole time you know Apple Google Facebook Amazon just grinding up and that's 2021 end of 2021 and they just had a blistering year again mm -hmm. you know those were the companies that like really delivered and the, the many companies that performed better than them you know the last few years um, that were growing faster that had more of that attraction and mm -hmm. so it was really around kind of just figuring out what how was how the traditional why was the traditional approach getting to the wrong answer in these companies? Mm -hmm. Like why was it saying there was these were sales when they're actually the best performing stocks? Mm -hmm. Like if you, it's pretty strange, isn't it? Like in most fields, if you took the top per, top few people, the specialists, got the academics, they all sat them in a room, and they said, okay, this is what we're doing, and actually it was the exact opposite of what they should have been doing. Yeah. You know, it was, mm -hmm. the disparity was that far. You know, where all the value people were saying these were shorts, these were like some of the he highest heaviest short highest short interest in the market, the most heavily shorted stocks, um, and also the best performing. So why was that? Why were the mm. smartest, most experienced people getting the wrong way around? Mm. And then trying to understand and think through that, and then that's kind of where it came from. Because you could mm. see that all those things had immense customer devotion, and that would spread like wildfire for years and years mm. and years. You could always see, even if you didn't agree with what the companies were doing or understand why people liked it, you could see that they were the sense that they were growing explosively and every year they were bigger, better and stronger. Mm. Um, you could also see that, you know, the multiples would whip around like crazy. So like effectively the valuation on whatever size they were at a particular time would be highly variable. But at the same time, the size they were were growing, you know, 50 to 100% a year. Mm. And that ended up being the dominant factor. So pulling that all together, that's kind of like the genesis of the strategy. It's like, well, what if find the companies that people love the most, the most customer support, um, that we can see that are growing really fast, and then we'll hold them over extended periods of time. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, yeah, it's simultaneously done very well, but it's also very different. Um, and it's kind of a long-term strategy as well, because mm -hmm. the only way you can do that is to hold these companies. And Tesla, Afterpay, um, what are some other ones you might know? There's more niche growth ones like Carvana, Shopify. You know, these companies all went through periods where they like long periods, particularly, you know, Tesla and Afterpay where they were down over extended periods of time. You know, then they occasionally they'd rally hard and they'd be back down in the dumps again. But then the people who perform best were the people who were able to hold it through that and really just focus on those two things rather than mm -hmm. trade around. So that was kind of the genesis. It's Did that genesis start when you were even younger? Like in high school where you kind of trading stocks all through uni and you started kind of thinking in this sort of mm -hmm. way and then you thought, okay, I should actually be, you know, making a career out of this and selling that idea to my investors. Yeah, look, I think uh, it was in a sense that I, my favourite stock was always Apple, and even now it's like worth $3 trillion or something, mm. just shout $3 mm. trillion. Mm. Um, we made a decision a couple of years ago in the fund not to buy those companies, which really mm. hurt us this year. Mm. We were like, you know, people can buy the, the top five somewhere else. Um, this year they've basically been the only performing stocks in tech, because it's been a bit of a, you know, there's been a huge rotation in the last few months. Um, but I guess when I was younger and I see other young people doing it, you kind of want to do a little bit of everything. You want to short mm. sell, you want to do industrials, you want to punt commodities, mm. random specky gold companies. You kind of want to do it all. And generally that doesn't work in life. It's too competitive and you're too generalist and you need to really focus and get a few things right rather than, you know, thousands mm. of little things. A few but, things very right. Yeah. But, uh, That's definitely something that me and Jimmy have sort of been learning about investing. We, mm. we were kind of really into uranium and having goes at that and then we're doing a few biotech like IHL and Calix. And then we've kind of recently been like, okay, we need to kind of just have, you know, a smaller number of stocks and a more specific sort of um, industries that we're looking at. So we'll kind of focus more on renewables because Jim has a renewable background. Yeah, so mm -hmm. we just, all right, well, Ron's favourite stock's Calix, so we can't get rid of that one. But um, the rest of it's just lithium. 
you know, mm. your core of FEM, obviously your Linus and Pilbara, they've done they yeah. a solid performance. But yeah, I'm just... Uh, What's that one that runs through? Vulcan Energy? Vulcan? Yeah, we, yeah. We, we, yeah, we got Vulcan, so... Yeah, right. <laughs> had a few short sellers, but you know, that's done great deals with um, Renault and um, uh, BMW or something like that, is it? Um, mm, mm. What do you do, just as just as an aside, like, so if you were in a company like what happened to Vulcan and there's sort of short sellers in the market like that, would that sort of, would that concern you if that's one of your stocks? Um, I don't know too much about Vulcan, um, other than like obviously we can read like, yeah. through their presentations a couple of times. Um, so no crazy insights. Most of the stuff that we own has extremely high short interest though. Yeah. So, you know, one of our best performers, short interest was 70%. If you look at the most heavily shorted stocks, our stocks are often on there. Um, funny enough. The one time that wasn't true was the beginning of this year. And we just had a blistering year last year, mm. like, like you know, up over 100%. Um, and then short selling across the market and across all our stocks went to like basically record lows. Mm. And that was the best possible, this would be the best environment to sell that I can remember since yeah. probably the GFC, because it's been like almost a year and everything's just gone down. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and there's been so many hype, so many like $40 billion companies with nothing there. Actually, that's child's play now. Yeah. You know, there's hundred billion dollar companies with no revenues. Yeah. Um, it's been it's probably the best short selling environment I can remember. Mm-hmm. Um, but now, kind of at the end of the year, everyone's everyone just kind of does what worked over the last six to twelve months. You know, on, on aggregate, mm-hmm. generally what people pile into is what has been working in the past. Mm-hmm. So now it's different. Like now that self has continued, particularly into this month. Now I can see short interest spiking all the way back up. Mm. And you know, in some of our stocks, the valuation levels are back down to where, where they were in COVID mm. and in deck 2018 before that. Like, and these were like major bottoms that these stocks then did several times afterwards. So it's really interesting to see those dynamics. Um, it's not something we trade, it's something we watch to give you an idea of where you are in the cycle. Um, I think you need to run your own race. I wouldn't, who's buying what is generally not a good way to mm. invest, whether they're selling mm. short or if there's a majority shareholder that you respect, you know, that might be the case, but generally you should do, you need to run your own race and do your own thing for your own reasons and kind of ignore what everybody else does. So this time of year, are you kind of going through all your holdings and being like, okay, we thought this one would kind of perform this way, this one won't, and you're kind of like filtering through it and maybe selling off one or two companies and, and getting another one? Is it, that's kind of like what you do maybe? Uh, it's not the time of year, I guess you like always... On you're always running through things. Yeah. You're always like reporting every three months, for example. Mm. Um, this has been a strange one for us because everything has generally performed really well across mm. the board. You know, fundamentals are strong, um, not just in our stocks, you know, in the economy and all that kind of thing. Mm. But at the same time, there's been this like brutal rotation where everybody's trading out of these gross stocks. You know, all the things that won last year mm. kind of on that out. They're coming back to the valuation lows. Everyone's chasing the quality. Um, but that then lays the seeds for the next mm. period of that performance, mm. you know, because now everybody's facing that way. Yeah. And our stocks are out of favour, so bodes well. And so I think, like you've said a few times, that you like to be 100% long all the time. Mm. And so, so if you, and there's lots of, people in the, lots of people out there saying interest rates are spiking, you know, so um, this is a big warning signal for equities. So... Just tell us about tell us about your philosophy. If you, if even if you thought we're going into a, a likely potentially going into a bit of a, a down period for the equity market as a whole, so how you, how would you set up your mm. fund from that if you believe that was the case? Well, the problem is, is like you'll believe that all the time. Yeah. You know, like two or three times a year, you're just gonna get bearish and be like, oh no, this is it. We're going yeah. down. This is the beginning of a bear market, or yeah. at least a 10, 20 percent sell off. Not sometimes you'll be right, but most of the time you won't be. You know, most of the thing, especially in our stocks that are growing so fast. Um, so if you're not if you don't if you're not there in that twenty five percent month, you know, or those two days where everything just rips fifteen, twenty percent, it's still happens when markets are selling off, you know, it'll be like one trading day they'll be up five to ten, and then the next trading day they'll be up five to ten. So it might be like a thirty hour period where these things have rallied hugely off the off the lows and then that could be it. You know, mm-hmm. that could they could just continue rallying for next year. So you kinda of have to be there, you can't retire these things. Um, and to the extent that, you know, people try, you see them, the most respected, largest fund managers, get them very, very wrong all the time. And so the idea is, if you had, if you had, if you had, if you only can do this for one single year, maybe then you'd be really, really careful. And you probably couldn't do any, anything approaching the strategy um, that we do now, which is why we say it's long term. Like, let's say I was like, I need to optimise my returns for one year, you probably take very little risk. You wouldn't be able to invest in these long-term opportunities that are extremely volatile. Mm-hmm. Um, 
but if you're young and you want to take that long-term view, and you're saying this is like our explicit strategy is to hold these companies that people love that are growing really fast, and we're going to take the short-term volatility because mm. we know that these things are going to be worth so much more in the future. Um, and that's our philosophy, that's our strategy, that's how we're going to operate. Then the decision is much easier. easier. Mm. Like over 20 or 30 years, that is probably going to outperform pretty much anything else. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's kind of like the thinking around it. Mm. But it's not... Yeah. Incentives around professional asset management are generally the opposite. Like it's really bad if you're down when indices are up. It's almost like potentially, it's like almost a fatal error. Yeah. It's not even an error, it's just something that happens. You know, whereas we don't, our exposure to the indices is basically zero. You know, we've explicitly avoided all the companies that are major components of market indices. I don't think we have any overlap with the ASX 200 you know, that I can think of off the top of my head. Mm. Um, I guess we want something zero. So occasionally there'll be one or two things that are there. Mm. Um, but ultimately, it's we're trying to generate do our own thing and generate, you know, market leading returns. Mm-hmm. And so the fact that most professionals won't operate this way because it's too risky and too difficult um, and too volatile, uh, and institutions won't like it, and a lot of the, those pressures uh, to try and minimise volatility as much as possible, even at the cost of cost of long term returns. Um, that's also a bit of an opportunity for us because it means that very few people, even when they want to, won't go down the path that we've done. Mm-hmm. So then, Michael, some of your early winners were Zero and Afterpay. What appealed to you about those companies? Um, I guess both of them were growing very strongly. Both of them had immense customer support. You know, Afterpay was pretty obvious. Um, with every quarterly update, the more and more people are using it and using it more and more often. Uh, and they're very good at highlighting those and mm-hmm. making it as clear as possible to anybody that, that looked. Um, so, and, and Zero had a similar effect amongst accountants where they all want to, you know, they're the pioneer of cloud-based accounting software. Accountants wanted to ship all the clients onto that. Um, and for good reason, too. And so those two both had compelling products. Customers love them. A different set of customers um, are growing pretty strongly. Mm. They're both pretty, pretty good investments. If you see those kind of mix of things, yeah, you know, and they'll, they'll, they'll extended periods without the top performers in the Australian market as well. Yeah. And I guess zero is, I mean, zero is, I think, tagline was it? accounting software that customers love or something like mm. that. So I suppose it was right in your kind of target zone, wasn't it? Definitely. You'll notice a lot of the best executives talk in the same way. Yeah. Yeah, Amazon or something. You know, Jeff Bezos will always talk about the customer. Yeah. Um, focus on that, not everything else. Even though it sounds so obvious, but the reality is in, in business, it's so easy to focus on literally everything else. Yeah. And what, so what would you say is like the most exciting sort of investment theme, thematic at the moment that that you guys are looking at or that you're looking to get exposure to? Um, it's a good question. I think the life sciences, there's a lot of stuff going on. This has been like a shocking year for life sciences in general, um, partly because it was such a good year, kind of last year into January, February, like huge speculative hot money came in, pushed prices up, speculative hot money is gone. The reality is the long-term potential is still there. Like there's companies, we have, we, I'm looking at multiple companies I um, mean, you know, they're trading basically down to cash now. We're like basically not valuing the value of their research and R&D at all. It's the, the shift has been that strong. Um, but, you know, there's some really promising platform technologies. Everyone knows mRNA, which was used for the vaccines, coronavirus vaccines. There's RNAi, which knocks out proteins instead of adding them in. That's extremely well developed now with a number of, of drugs in the pharmacy um, and a huge pipeline. Uh, so it's a company we own there, which is a core holding, which we don't really talk about much, called Unlylum. That's super exciting business. Um, this protein, these things that kind of break down particular proteins in a targeted way. It's can effectively target, theoretically, almost any protein in the body and just destroy it. Mm-hmm. And that's generally like what causes disease. So again, it's like a technique, a platform technology that you can use to target multiple mm-hmm. indications. And so there's a couple of companies there that... Um, we invested in. It's pretty early stage and they're pretty richly valued, so there is some level of success. Mm. Well, they certainly were, less so now. <laughs> There's yeah. some level of success kind of um, priced into those. Yeah. Um, but it's also, it's, it's pretty new. It's not often that you get these kind of explosions of new indications and new drug development, and that's, we're going through one of those now. Mm. And I guess, like, with all these new variants, we just had the Omicron variant, would you be predicting that there's going to be more sort of variants coming out, and that's why you kind of want to move into those new technologies to you know, satisfy mm. that. That's interesting. Mm. I mean, the, the conventional viewers, viruses, will, when they come out, they become safer with time. 
mm. generally. Like more, of, sometimes more virulent, um, but less kind of lethal. And that's basically what happened in, um, what they call it, the uh, influenza of 1918. You know, that's still amongst us circulating around. Um, it's also a way that people use that principle to kind of make vaccines. So you get a virus and you pass it through a human cell, pass it through another one, you just keep doing that until it slowly evolves. It's only the way things are making more adaptable to human cells, less toxic, um, but, but often pass through easy, but if effectively live better in that envi human cell environment. Mm. Um, so there's no guarantees, things can get worse rather than better, but broadly what we've seen in coronavirus is that in action. So, you know, with all the waves, they've kind of been less and less deadly, largely. That's like a bit of a generalisation, but you can mm. see Omicron as mm. kind of the extension of that, whereas so far there's very few hospitalisations. And again, you have to um, tease the fact that lots of people got coronavirus that aren't in the data, um, and then also lots of people are vaccinated as well. But still even, and it's not me doing the work, still when you read the papers of people that are doing early studies of this, it does seem to have become much less toxic. Um, which would fit the pattern of, of other kind of viruses. Um, that's just like a topic of interest. It's kind of, we were pretty early on in investors in Moderna. Yeah. Um, and one thing that has happened which surprised us is that it's very clear that everybody's going to get a booster and probably, you know, an annual thing. Mm. Like that was kind of like a wild, up, from an investment perspective, upside case that, you know... Mm. Um, Whereas there was, a, there was another wet line of thinking that was, well, once everybody in the Western world has taken two, that might be it for these companies yeah. for the vaccine. Mm -hmm. um, that might be kind of broadly the end of, beginning of the end of their franchise. But increasingly, it looks like that will continue and, and this will be something they'll be kind of developing new vaccines for, for quite some time. Mm -hmm. So do you guys look at, um, do you look at IPOs? Is that, is that sort of a key part of it? And, with that in mind, do you look at unlisted companies as well within these things? Is that sort of part of the business, or is it just pretty much purely listed businesses you look at? Yeah, so that was the uh, thinking about venture fund. So we did a bit of private company investing ourselves using our mm -hmm. own balance sheet. Um, it was quite successful in the sense that it got us early access into some really cool companies that we probably wouldn't have seen so early. Yeah. Um, Capify is one. Um, so you got to meet management and understand the business before it's listed, and then when it's listed, you can add. Firstly in IPOs, secondly in secondly, you're just kind of ahead of the game, you've known the company for longer. Um, generally, generally you have better access as well um, to management because mm. you've kind of been with them on the journey for a, a little bit longer than you know, people who just invest in public markets. Mm. And so we'll continue to do that and we'll do that because we're looking for these, be these amazing companies super early on in their journey mm. and then sort of we can back them the whole way through um, to listing and beyond. Mm. Um, that's really the plan. And, you know, there's a few examples we've already done. Mm. And so with those, that management, me and Jimmy, we kind of like the stocks we pick because we, we look at who's, like, the head sort of person. Like, we love the theme of the guy. There's, like, a doctor who runs Calyx. And then there's another guy called Dr. Sud Agarwal who runs, like, the Inconex fund. And we kind of think that investing in those companies, um, they're just kind of having a real sort of belief in the... The particular figure rather than the company as a whole is that kind of in your train of thinking in terms of like maybe campify or um it can i think mm. in that case i think managers are an exceptional job um you've got to be careful though because management teams are generally very charming they're all impressive individuals mm. they've all yeah. generally risen to the top of of competitive corporate political environments mm. they're very they speak very well they're on message they pitch their company many many times and this is one of like, they've got several decades experience from mm -hmm. doing this. Uh, so you can be led astray by management and you can also, there's like a false confidence that can come from thinking that you have an inside track when you don't, when the factors that drive performance actually in the future and might be out, might be out of everyone's control. You know, so sometimes if you're really close with management, you sometimes feel that you have an edge that you don't. Mm -hmm. And it's less risky because, you know, you know the CEO maybe not even on a personal basis. Mm -hmm. um, then again, the flip side is there's obviously some executives who just have performed for decades. Um, cases in point, think people like Jeff Bezos. You know, mm. you could read his memo 20 years ago and be like, wow, this, this person is a really clear thinker. If you mm. back that person the whole way through, you've done exceptionally well. Mm. Even though, you know, that company lost 90% of its value, you know, mm. and, and had horrific bear markets and, and multi-year multi periods 
but it was down for extended periods of time. That, that's actually a, a pretty common theme, actually, when you think about it, that these mm -hmm. top-performing companies, like they have a stomach for volatility, these executives, yeah. they have a mission and they're just going to do it. And if the stock's down for three, four years, that is just what is happening at the moment. That's not going to stop mm -hmm. them. Um, Elon Musk is another one. Again, like, yeah, I was going to mention that. Like, if he just opened a new company up, you yeah. probably think a lot of people would have a lot of confidence. In he has right. Like SpaceX, yeah. you know, boring company. He's he'll he'll raising capital will mm. not be a problem for him ever if he if he barely needs it at the moment. You know, but he's. I'd say that also shows you how hey, you got to be careful when assessing management, because when Tesla was trading at, I think it was what was it? I don't know one two times sales, twenty times EBITDA. Like it's trading cheap for a company growing at the rate it was. Mm -hmm. um, that was when he was doing all these weird, pedophilic cave, you know, cave scandal, and he was tweeting things, and he went on Joe Rogan and was smoking weed online, and yeah. you know, just all these things that were just kind of off-putting to a lot of people. And that was like that was pretty close to the low around then. Mm -hmm. um, could have helped cause a low. Could have caused people to sell and people who might have bought to step back. Uh, the stock went up more than ten times, you know, in the, in the short years after that period. Mm -hmm. So you could have looked at him and said, actually. You know what? I think he's kind of going off on a tangent. He's being a bit of a wild, wild card at the moment, and I don't really want to back somebody that you know is saying these things, and I don't agree with that. And and that would have led you to the wrong conclusion. Um, actually, the one that annoys me most, still to this day, is a company that we did a fair bit of work on. I felt we had like proper insight into this mm. thing. It was a renewable energy company, um, and basically, uh, they put out. There was a company that was they put out a short report. Yeah. What happened was the executives, the short sellers were sniffing around and like trying to interview people, like past employees, get kind of inside scoop. Um, and the executives became aware that their short selling report was about to come out. And so the short report dumped. And like most short reports, in my opinion, generally they're not very good. Occasionally you get one that's like piercing and accurate. Um, but like more recently, they've generally just been 100 page documents listing 100 random facts, you know. And it'll be things like, we went to their office and there was nobody there. You know, well, for most of like my business existence, the <laughs> office was like a lawyer's office. So you could have walked to the front door at any time and said, where's Michael Bradley? He's like, well, he's not here. You know, it's just, just like those little things. And that'd be like, you know, point number 52 on the short report. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, they're generally not very good. And this one, it didn't seem very good. But then the CEO, I think the other manager team, just sold all the shares. Mm -hmm. like and so I was like, well, mm -hmm. the CEO is selling. I can't, like, should I be selling? You know. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure, I would have happily backed them if they were in it, but if there's a short report that you think is false and the CEO sells all their shares, it's very hard to kind of think that there's, it's very hard to take the opposite view of that, mm -hmm. which is, as it turned out, what we should have done because it went up four times, um, actually I think more, uh, shortly after in the mm -hmm. kind of, I guess it was probably a bit over a year, a year and a half. And, so, you know, so it would have been one of our better performing stocks and it was a strong performer this year and kind of needed something. Um, they did something like that, they did really well in the renewable space. So there's multiple examples of where focusing too much on management can get you to the wrong conclusion. And I think increasingly we prefer good numbers, explosive growth, customer support, and they have been far better predictors of what will happen next mm. than anything else. So, like, um, I know I haven't... I, I, Listen to quite a lot of this stuff, but I haven't heard you talk much about this one. Like, what what do you think about the psychology of investing? So, people who are investing in your fund, like, obviously you've had you've had, you've had a great run, like the last couple of years, it's just going spectacularly well. But at the early days, I think there was some dips when you first started, perhaps. And so, did you have your investors calling you up on a Friday night saying, "Oh, what's going on, Michael?" You know, mm. um, and sort of, did you, did you have to coach your people who are investing at all, or? Uh, we try to be pretty clear about what we do. Mm. Um, yeah, at the moment we're kind of going through a drawdown now, right? Because it's been a great year for us, you know, the back of a very, this very, very good year last year. Um, most people are pretty respectful. Generally, if they really want, if they want to go, they can redeem their funds. Like, we'll just work for somebody as long as they want us to. You know, there's no gates mm. or anything like that. Um, generally, I've been surprised. And we also get a lot of people buying the debt when we're down as well. So when we drew down this year, we actually got net inflows the whole way through, which is a surprise, mm. surprise to us. Um, but it was good because it paid off nicely for those people. And I think that was extremely well after that. So even in COVID, when there was a huge sell-off, nobody redeemed. Um, one person added right at the bottom, um, and people added, you know, shortly after as well. 
So you do get kind of people that are trying to do that. I think because we're quite consistent about what we do, um, you know, we're just going to keep doing it. Um, we're just going to stay invested in these amazing companies. Mm. They all, you know, extremely high conviction. Nothing's guaranteed, of course. Extremely high conviction. These will be the best performers in the next five and ten years. Um, also, guaranteed there'll be dips and thirty percent drawdowns, and you know, the, th the next thirty years there'll be multiple two-year bear markets, um, which will be very nasty and difficult to survive. And you know, over the long term, you'll create a ton of value, and that's the kind of thing that we're optimizing for. Um, I think we're pretty clear about that. And most people, the very vast majority of people, have stuck with us through all those dips and did extremely well at the back end. Yeah, it's interesting. I think it's also kind of a bit like a stock. I mean, it's very obvious to most people that if you put money in a stock, it drops 30% and you sell, that's just losing money. That's stupid. Mm -hmm. it's, it's not a strategy. Mm -hmm. That's literally how to very quickly lose a lot of money. Um, whereas at the flip side, everybody and like most people who invest with us are successful businessmen or successful in some, very successful in some field of life. They know that to really create value, you do it over long periods of time. You do it through the good times and the bad times and generally you can end up, that's how you make huge amounts of wealth. And if you think about all the wealthy people you know, the odds are they did own a business and they just held it for a very long period of time. They didn't trade it, they didn't like have a bad quarter and then sell it. You know, and then when things were going really good, like buy it back, you know, it's the opposite. And I think that's a dynamic that will be most successful, particularly in a fund like ours where there's there's just for the nature of the fact we're in a lot of consumer stocks with high short interest, a lot of hot money comes in and out. So it's great, we don't need catalysts. You know, when I was kind of learning the craft, catalysts were a big thing. It's like what upcoming things will push the price around. We've never really had that issue. Like if things have done well and they've added users, generally they've done spectacularly well, you know, two years later. Um, but the flip side is you do get these periods of hot money where everyone just kind of like vanishes and then comes rushing back, you know, months later. and. Yeah, you just have to believe in the long term and, and stick to it. And so, you did like you did some work with some non for profit industries as well. Um, what would you like recommend to people sort of doing that work? Do you think it's like important that aside from your work at the fund, that you kind of serve on a few of these boards, and do you find that that kind of you know maybe helps with your life balance or things like that? Um, yeah, I think it's good. I mean, I'm kind of on the field. I think the people who do most good often do it in business. Yeah. Like, you know, Moderna probably did more than for the world than most most kind of philanthropic institutions. Mm -hmm. You know, everybody, there's a lot of people in business that are really trying to do good and they're mission driven and they're convinced that their mission will, and they're probably accurate, if they succeed in their mission, that would be great for everybody. Look at like what Tesla's done versus, mm -hmm. you know, all the kind of philanthropic attempts to help the planet and then compare that to that. What Elon Musk did. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah, I'd so say true. that is like so much more powerful, but there's obviously a role for that as well. So, you know, we, we fund a bit of medical research um, into diseases at various places and we'll probably do a lot more of that. Um, so I think it is important and I think there's definitely a lot of things that don't get funded. So I think at the moment a lot of philanthropy is going in towards climate change and that's like, mm. that's like the fashionable thing and everything's flowing in that direction. Mm. Um, whereas like kind of like the fundamental scientific research is just always chronically underfunded. Like there's so much good stuff that should be done that just there's not enough money to do. You know, you have academics, you know, struggling to get hundred thousand dollar grants um, to do potentially life saving work. Uh, I find that more interesting, and that's kind of where we focus our energies on. Mm, like there is more impact stocks rather than just like, you know. Uh, I was thinking mm. in, terms of, in terms of like actual research where there's not even necessarily any commercial benefit. Mm. Um, but similarly, yeah, those companies we put. A lot of money into those kind of life sciences companies mm. and it's pretty tough going because they're volatile risky um, but you know if we put money into cap raise or an IPO and it goes on balance sheet and that then you know purchases is used to kind of commercialize some university technology and it hits the clinic and it wouldn't have been there otherwise like it's probably like the most valuable part of what we do as well mm. and it's 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 an area where there you can get spectacular returns as well Mm. And we've seen that, like some of our best performers have been in life sciences as well. Mm. And so you like did some of your own work though, didn't you? Like on a non-for-profit company, like what was that? Did that kind of help with your life balance, do you think? Doing... Um, I'm trying to think about what, I assume, are you talking about St Vincent's? Australian Museum. Australian Museum. Yeah, Australian Museum, yeah I thought that in some kind of youth things. Yeah. Mm. yeah, I guess they're fun, they're interesting. Yeah. Mm. 
tutors, the tutoring? Yeah, done a bit of tutoring. Yeah. Yeah. Done a few things like that. Yeah. Okay. That okay, now we've all seen like Wolf of Wall Street, Michael, and so and I think some people like um, even even like Ron, you know, even not who he's not like studying finance and things like that. And people have a perception of what the industry's like and so is it like a real macho culture, you know? So when you head along to industry events here in Sydney, is that is is, is it like that these days, or um, is that sort of an issue? Is it, is it a good thing or bad thing? Or what's uh, your it's perception like of Wall Street? Yeah. I'd say in general it's probably changed. So yeah. when I entered, when I was in, in university, it was kind of like the, the end of like an era in the sense that that was kind of like '90s finance. Yeah. People treated young people poorly. Um, you know, it's probably much, much, much more sexist than it is now, um, in many different ways. Um, and it was, I think there was like a lot of piggish behaviour going on as well. Yeah. You know, like people get, I remember there was a Christmas party here where everyone, everyone who got more than a million bucks got a limo and they drove around Sydney and carried on like <laughs> fools. Oh um, you know, that kind of behaviour. Yeah. I don't think you get it. After the financial crisis, when everybody started hating bankers, like really started hating them, um, that stuff became unacceptable. There were huge layoffs. A lot of the investment banks shrunk almost every year um, until recently. So they weren't like necessarily happy places to be. And then I think a lot of young kids, this young smart, like when I was at university, most of the smart kids wanted to get into finance. I don't think they think that anymore. Now they want to get into startups, tech, um, and for good reason. They'll treat you much better. It's much more exciting, much, in many ways, much more mission driven. Uh, and you can also make a lot more money. So all those things kind of are increasingly obvious and are pushing people in different directions. Mm -hmm. I think that's a good thing. And so how do you like sort of balance like working so much here and then like your personal life? Like do you have a, a structure in the week where you're okay, weekends, I'm not looking at emails? Um, like is there any sort of things that you try and do so you're able to just, you know, relax when you need to relax or Um Yeah, I guess it's not a huge focus. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're just yeah, I guess you're you're a lot younger than a lot of the other people we talk to, so you're probably full of energy and Yeah, but I think you do it. The math's pretty intense, like even when things are going right. There's things going wrong. Mm. Um, you know, it's literally, there's, there's no, you think about who you're competing against, competing against everybody, you know, company insiders, mm. the smartest people in the US and Silicon Valley, you're in our field, there's funds with, you know, the, as you just have data scientists and web scrapers mm. that know all the data before it comes out and you're competing against them. So you have to kind of respect that. It's actually quite, mm. I don't think you can do it lightly or do it. Mm. But is part of that though like then making sure that you have a good team so that you can like rely on them to do that sort of work or do you kind of make sure that you're always you know in the mix of things and and working on it with them? It's a good question I mean mm. it's good that we got a bit of scale so we can have different team members focusing on different things mm. um, but ultimately you just have to take responsibility and there's no way around it you know, it's, it's not the easiest thing yeah. I encourage people not to do it actually. Yeah. <laughs> And so, like, I have a mate who actually does sort of night shifts for another, like, fund. And he, like, personally, he finds it really difficult, like, working night shifts and things like that. Like, if you had someone who was working here who perhaps maybe was struggling with working those awkward hours, you know, following certain stocks. What do you mean night shifts? So, like, following, like... <laughs> Like, he'll follow overseas um, US stocks. stay up for US time. Yeah, like, yeah. he's like a trade mm. monitor. Mm. And so maybe you don't do that sort of work here, but say, like, someone was doing some sort of stressful sort of job that was awkward hours. Like, would you kind of... How would you kind of um, manage that, like, with that person if they were stressed out at work with what was happening? Um, <laughs> it's a good question. I don't think we'd hire somebody that was going to get too stressed out. Yeah, it's a stressful industry. So that's, that's sort of part of your I don't think employing do strategy. I don't think it would be the right place for yeah. somebody. Mm. I don't think financial markets are a good place if you're prone to stress and break down. Because <laughs> 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 yeah. yeah. you'll yeah. be put to the test pretty quickly. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah, I'm not sure. But you know, it's, it's not easy. It's, the way I think about it is like most people should probably do something else. Um, there's, you can make a ton of money in so many different industries yeah. mm -hmm. and very few people do very well in this one. It's very public. Mm -hmm. If somebody's successful in this industry, it's very public and everybody mm -hmm. kind of sees it and um, the, you know, the vast majority of wealth is not created in funds, you know, it's created mm -hmm. in businesses, um, even in real estate, it's obviously not mm -hmm. quite as exciting. Um, a lot of people, in five, six years, you can build a global tech business. 
you know, if you get things right. Mm. And you don't have to build it. You could be an early employee at that, have a sizable chunk and do extremely well. Mm. And maybe then work at another one. And then five years after that, maybe you're ready to do your own one. There's so many different trajectories that I think are better suited to a lot of people. Mm. Um, they have all the like rewards and that the top funds get. Um, mm. But aren't quite so as grueling and competitive and, Mm. Actually, I'm sure startup people would not like me saying that. <laughs> yeah. So you've always, the field's very yeah. competitive and grueling. So you've always found that you're pretty good at like handling all like stressful situa- situations. You have like a big meeting of investors. Um, you're pretty like suited to it. And I guess yeah, with your employers, you make sure that they hit that criteria as well. Yeah, I think you can. Mm. It's not a place that you need to be able to think pretty clearly mm. in all environments. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Okay, and so final question here, Michael. So, what would be your advice for someone who's just starting out and the starting out and say they're like Ron's mate, who's at, mm. who's who's just starting his career and um, at a hedge fund, I think it is in Melbourne, right? And so, if you're trying to create a career in it, what would be your advice to, to people? Um, that's probably right. I think get a job wherever you can. I think the sell side's the best. So the sell side is brokers, investment banking, um, sales trading. There's a whole range of firms from, you know, Goldman Sachs and those kind of top tier um, investment banks. Then there's kind of like a a number of small brokers um, who are often looking for young, smart, hungry kids. Um, The sell side's good because you meet a ton of people, you're kind of in the middle of it. The good brokers have high net worth clients, they're working with companies, they're across everything that's happening in the market. I think they're good places to learn, good places to get involved, and generally they're Generally, they're looking for young, smart, hungry people as well. Mm. So I definitely recommend that. But also think hard about it because it's actually something you want to do, and why. Because mm. if you just want to make money, there's probably easier ways. Yeah. <laughs> um, but if you have to do it and you like really, really want to do it, then the, this whole industry is, revolves around hiring young, smart, hungry people. Mm. You, just, you will just have to find a way to demonstrate that to somebody. Yeah. Mm. Well, thank you for having us today, Michael. We really appreciate it. You too, you. Um, cheers. Yeah, thanks for coming by. We appreciate it. Thanks. <laughs>
it's a really good point, Ron. Uh, I know I love talking to you about footy and love saying how if I'm doing my tipping for the week ahead, then I'll say I was listening to the post-match interview with Clark O or someone like that, and I'll put a lot of weight on that in terms of when I'm thinking about who's going to win the next week. You do, yeah. yeah. But then what Michael was saying was that, say, in a business sense, all the CEOs are impressive. So it's, you can't really tell tell apart by just based on what you think of the CEO. So yeah, and then the other thing that you know I really liked was how he started his blog. And um, it's a bit like what we're doing with the podcast. So basically, he started his blog back in, I think, 2016 or 2015. And he kind of talked about what he was doing with his investing. And that's where he started sort of the framework we got today and talked about his um, genesis and his philosophy of investing. And from doing that, having that online presence, he was actually able to then sort of grow an audience and a following online. And then from that, he then obviously started his hedge fund. Um, and so I thought that was quite impressive, an impressive um, thing that he did, mm. and um, it's a great learning for us. Yeah, definitely, Ron. Um, I just love what he said about how you know people will listen if you go out and have an opinion on things. And you know, as we saw, Michael, you know, he's quite a charismatic guy. So um, you know, when he has a view on things, he has a strong conviction. I'm not surprised that he's got a lot of good followers. So I guess Ron, look, it was such an insightful interview and it flowed on really well from, from Sergio the week before. And so hopefully those two interviews give our listeners a few ideas to invest in for 2022. Yeah, I hope they do. Um, <laughs> but um, yeah, so if you if you enjoy you know, this new video format that me and Jimmy are doing, make sure you hit the subscribe button on um, the YouTube platform. And also know that we've got a few, um, we've got our podcast channel as well that's got plenty of audio versions of interviews that we've done with a few other people. And um, if you want to check out that content, look below in the descriptions and we have links to all your favourite platforms, um, be it Spotify, Google or um, iTunes. Yeah, and lastly, look, um, if subscribing and following us on those platforms or on social media it's just the best way you can help us to keep the lights on and the podcast flowing. And finally, I think, Ron, we'd love to get your feedback, so feel free to drop us an email at any time just with uh, feedback about the shows or guest ideas. We uh, always love to hear from you. Cheers, mate. Cheers, Ron. See you guys next week.